Hello everyone, welcome. I hope you're all having a great day. I want to thank you so much for clicking on this video as it's pretty different from my normal type of content which is relaxing gaming let's plays, sort of. Now occasionally I will tell you all my thoughts and feelings about games, especially if it's like a new game that I'm trying out for the first time. However, today I'm going to be doing more of a straight up gaming review, sort of in the style of one of my favorite YouTubers, Jenny Nicholson. <laughs> now I have gone ahead and sort of separated out all my talking points, so if you're curious to hear about any particular point of this video or the game, you can click on the timeline to jump to that. And it also has helped me organize all my thoughts and feelings, because I have a lot of thoughts and feelings about this game. So the first thing I want to talk about is my history with the Endless Ocean franchise and just a brief history on the Endless Ocean franchise for those who aren't familiar. I do want to give you guys a quick warning before I go any further in the video though. This video will have footage, quite a lot of footage, of deep sea uh, scenery, like moving from shallow water over say a sheer cliff face into like a vast ocean where you can't see the bottom. I mean, I do go to the bottom, it's not that deep, but for those of you who have like thalassophobia and fears of the open ocean and stuff like that, you might not find this video as relaxing. All I will say that um, there's really nothing threatening in the game, and I'm gonna talk about that quite a lot, but uh, it might be good therapy for those of you who have fears of the open ocean. Oh, and there will also be depictions of sharks and other predators like that. Although, again, they're not actually aggressive or dangerous whatsoever in this game. So the first Endless Ocean game was released for the Wii in, well, North America, like 2008 and um, 2007 for other parts of the world. And it was sort of a chill, adventure, scuba diving game which was a spiritual successor to another game that I didn't play, but this was my beginning with the Endless Ocean franchise, and it was truly the beginning of the Endless Ocean franchise. Now, it's been a while since I played this original game, so my memories of this one are kind of foggy. I just sort of vaguely remember the dives and couple of the characters. I remember this whole thing with this girl's dad and um, whales. There was a big um, part of the story revolved around like these whales. I actually think both of them featured whales heavily. Um, it was really popular. The game did really well and a couple years later the sequel was released, Endless Ocean 2 Adventures of the Deep or Endless Ocean 2 Blue World as it was known in North America. Um, so that's how I knew it. And this one was truly an expanded experience with a much more of a plot. There were more characters that you would interact with and dive with, and there were all these different regional maps to explore. Uh, this is the one that I remember most, and I feel like most people do because it was truly a very good sequel in my book. <laughs> It was very memorable, very fun. The plot, once again, there was like quite a lot to do with whales and kind of a mythical ocean dwelling people, I believe, the Okeanos, and um, there was like this French girl and her dad that ran a uh, like a diving service that they, you know, picked up. Um, I think they just dove to get like artifacts in the water and you're joining them. I think you were a student and you're studying like the legend of these like ocean people and creatures and then other people kind of end up joining the company who have different specialties like there's a salvage guy, there's a um, 
like a biologist. I, never, I remember her name was Hayako. What would, what would she do? She was the smart one. Uh, <laughs> she works in the uh, aquarium at, uh, in Japan, and so you would go there often, and you could, like, put stuff in the aquarium. Uh, anyway, uh, there were a lot of different maps to explore in that, a lot of different creatures, there was even, like, fun little sort of side quest things to do, where you would, uh, look for treasure or train a dolphin, for example, and then the dolphin would swim with you. <laughs> Um, it was, it was very fun. So this was released in 2010, and clearly, uh, that was it for the series, or so we thought. So if you've watched any of my sort of ocean-based videos on the channel, you've probably heard me talk about it, about what a huge fan I am. As a kid, I was a huge marine biology nerd. I, I even was in a marine biology club. And I entered in a, like a statewide marine biology contest that I won. So, I mean, a huge, huge nerd for the ocean and other things, but uh, we're talking about the ocean today. So, imagine my shock and excitement when they announced back in February of 2024 that the next iteration of the Endless Ocean series, Endless Ocean Luminous, was going to be coming out in a few months. Uh, I tried to contain my hype. It was pretty great. I've been talking about wanting another Endless Ocean game, or even just having the game remastered for the Switch or PC, <laughs> uh, would be amazing. So, uh, it finally came out, I immediately downloaded it and jumped in just to play on my own, knowing that I would be making a video with you guys. I'd originally intended for this to be a standard gameplay kind of video. I thought we'd just, like, dive around and explore. But after playing for just 20-30 minutes, I could tell that this was not the game I was expecting, not the game I was hoping for, and possibly not a game I could recommend. Now, I talk about this a lot on my channel, but if you don't know, I typically only like to play games that I personally recommend. That's why yeah, I don't do too many review videos, because I don't like to take a negative approach to anything. And I don't want to necessarily be negative about a game, about someone's hard work. But because this was like quite a big Switch release, I felt like it was okay to do a review of it. Because in the end, I both like and dislike Endless Ocean Luminous. I can't say if I recommend or don't recommend it to you. That's why I'm going to talk about it in this video, show you my own gameplay, and let you form your own conclusions based on what I have to say today. So I hope this will help you if you're on the fence. If you're here for the ASMR, you're in for a long, rambly treat. And if you're here for the ocean vibes, they're there too. Don't expect me to make too many videos like this. Um, yeah, I mean, I like doing this, but we'll see. <laughs> okay, first things first, let's talk about the story, because that was a big part of the first two games, especially the second one. I actually really remember a lot of the story beats from that. So when you start up the game, it just completely throws you into the story right off the bat. This is how it looks. Uh, loading in and immediately starting chapter one, the changing ocean. So there was really no, like menu or any anything. Immediately, this AI named Sarah, spelled S-E-R-A, starts talking to you. That stands for uh, Survey Exploration and Research Assistant AI. So it should be Sarah. But anyway, uh, I found Sarah insanely annoying. Maybe it's just the AI voice. I, prefer, I would prefer if it was just like real voice acting, but uh, I did not enjoy this AI voice talking to me. I don't even like AI in real life. So literally, like, the first thing I did, as soon as I stopped talking to her, was immediately went and just turned it off. <laughs> just off completely. I don't want to hear it. 
and I don't miss her voice at all. Then after I returned to the game, it started the basic sort of tutorial. Here's how you move the air diver, here's how you move the camera, and most importantly, here's how you scan. Scanning is one of the main gameplay mechanics in the Blue Ocean series. It's largely an exploration and creature collection sort of game, and by creature collection, it's really like creature data collection. So you scan like this, you would be shown like the name, the scientific name, and in here like the size. So Sarah tells us about this failed sea where we are, where it's constantly changing, and then says, feel free to look around and then tell me when you want to leave. And then she just like immediately ends the level, so that was weird. There was no looking around. And then that was chapter one. After that, we are thrown in the main menu screen where, I guess theoretically, you could do a dive. I'll just kind of like look through some of the options. Like there's this profile uh, where I guess it maybe shows you some of your stats. So we've not really done much of anything here. That's no surprise. Uh, and then there's like a customize button where you could customize your diver. I mean, this makes sense. There was like light customization in the previous games. We've clearly grown our like color palettes a lot, which is pretty cool. Uh, but you do have to like pay for it. Obviously not in like real life currency because my god, the game was already $50. <laughs> Having microtransactions in this would be insane. And then, you know, you can customize like the specific aspects of your suit. I like that. I even like that there's like this sticker feature. So through leveling and ranking up, you would unlock these new stickers, I guess. And I don't know if it's free placement or not because I didn't have any money to pay for it. Then there's the emojis, which I assume are mainly for the multiplayer. As someone who isn't planning on doing any sort of multiplayer co-op, this seems largely useless to me. I feel like even when I play co-op games, I don't use these emotes, like, unless maybe I happen to be taking a screenshot, which is rare. So, I just kind of look through them quickly, but yeah, this seemed like a waste of animations to me, but that's just me. Then there's this thing called Mystery Board. This is really, like, not explained. Uh, it sort of is, but not like, <laughs> not for a while. And then the logs, uh, by logs, these are like, this is where you're, yeah, after you catalog stuff. So here's our, our single humphead wrasse that we've seen. It's the only fish we've seen. And here's where you would read about them and look at the different, the, the fish models and, and whatever. And then there's also one for the salvage stuff, which we don't have any at the so let's go ahead and, I guess, access chapter 2. It's very confusing to me that the story is laid out this way, as in the previous games, the story went hand in hand with the dives. This seems to be completely separate, which honestly is sort of a bizarre choice. So here's chapter 2, the world coral. Alright, let's see what happens in the world coral. Thank goodness we turned off Sarah's voice, because that was really annoying. Our destination is a nearby cave, so we're being told explicitly where to go. A little marker on the screen, and also some more uh, movement tutorials, like moving up and down and a dolphin kick. Oh, and by the way, in case you're wondering, there's like an invisible wall. So I can't go any further than that point, and I wanted to swim down in this crevice, and... Yep, there's an invisible wall there as well, as you can see. Okay, so ignoring that, I will continue along to this waypoint that I've been given. I'm immediately stopped. Sarah's gonna talk to us some more. Yep, really fascinating. Okay, I don't know why she had to stop me for that. Let me continue on to the next waypoint. Some of these sound effects are actually quite nostalgic. I like that a lot of them are the same as previous games, I will say. So this is the world coral in the canyon. 
so this this is the world coral whatever that is it's a unique ecosystem but it's dying it looks bad and we don't know why so it's up to us to figure out why the world coral is dying <laughs> it's a critical part of the ecosystem i guess and i'm part of this project aegis i guess okay thank you then you're given two options i don't know what happened if you said unsure oh, you probably would be like well tough you have to do it anyway We will not be allowed to return, basically saying, this is, this is it. Get your good look at it. Then we are turned around, we have no control over our character, and we are fade to black out of here, and back out to the beginning. And again, this is all just like a cutscene, like, I have no control. Uh-oh, something's happening though. What is it? What is this arrow? Uh-oh, unusual biometrics. It's a giant fish with a weird texture. <laughs> Looked like a big coelacanth. Researchers may be in danger. And Sarah agrees, it looks like a really big coelacanth. So she says, it's not safe. We could be in danger, there's seismic activity detected, and she suggests we use a dolphin kick to get away faster. So I'm like, okay, I'm getting my controller ready, I'm gonna dolphin kick and swim away as fast- oh. Okay, it was just a cutscene. Okay, I actually have no control over my character. And I guess I'm out of danger now. And that was it. That was chapter two, the world coral, which I was honestly so underwhelmed by that it made me not want to do any more of the story chapters. But of course I will. I'll do the next one because this is a review video and I need to give it at least like one more shot. But I was so insanely disappointed. Like I love the story in the Endless Ocean games and that was just 10 seconds of a movement tutorial and then just me pressing A a bunch. Why did you tell me about the dolphin kick if I wasn't going to utilize the dolphin kick? I, I, I don't know. I will talk about chapter 3 later when we discuss the characters. But at this point, I just kind of felt frustrated. Like, where's the actual expla exploration and the, and the animals and all that? Where's my actual endless ocean gameplay? And I assume that that comes in the solo dive. Or the other you know, one if you're doing co-op. But I'm by myself today, so we're gonna dive into the solo dive. Which again, it's odd that it's completely separate from the story, but whatever. So, a huge difference between this and the previous Endless Ocean games is the map. In Endless Ocean 2, which is the one I'm probably going to reference the most because it's the one that I played more recently and remember better. There were like six speci like region specific maps. There was Kitama Atoll, which is meant to be like a South Pacific uh, tropical region. There was the Cicero Strait, which I think was meant to be in like the Aegean Sea. There was the north coast of Canada, which had a lot of uh, an Arctic setting and um, polar bears and sharks. There was the Weddell Sea, which was like the other cold water region, and this was like the Antarctic, Antarctic Ocean. And there was the Cortica River midstream, which was really cool. It was the freshwater map that was like taking place in the Amazon, and um, it was basically in a river. I really enjoyed that one. And there was the Zahab region, which was like the Red Sea off the coast of Egypt, and that one was really cool. So you had these very region-specific maps that had the specific appropriate um, flora and fauna for those regions. So like I said, you would see, you know, narwhals and polar bear in the Arctic, or you would see uh, freshwater dolphins in the Cortica River midstream, or there was piranhas, you know? It was, it was very cool. 
and I really enjoyed having to go back and fully explore each part of the map, like unlock the whole thing and discover every species native to that region. Now, Endless Ocean Luminous changed the game by making it one procedurally generated map, which when I first heard that, definitely gave me pause. Now, I can quite like and appreciate procedural generation in games. I do think it's a lot of the future of games, but I was not sure that this was the type of game that suited procedural generation, but, you know, I was going to give it the benefit of the doubt. So you would just have this one map that you could revisit or start a new map, or I guess you could put in like a specific key for a map that maybe like a friend found and they liked. So this was my very first one, and something I noticed right off the bat was that the procedural generation didn't feel well done. There were these clear kind of subset regions that they had obviously modeled, and then all those are just kind of like randomly located. So I've played two different maps one from the game I was playing earlier, and this one that I just started now, and I noticed the exact same sort of locations, but just on a different part of the map. Like this shipwreck model. I have already seen this shipwreck model, like, four times. It was cool the first time, and then the second time I was like, oh, here it is again, just, you know, several meters away, and now it's like, okay, I'm, I'm tired of this. And the thing that bugs me the most is that there's always an artifact right here in this one spot. It's always this, like, bottle. So this is, like, my third or fourth one. Um, just feels lazy, honestly. So, I understand that procedural generation, especially in, you know, an exploration game, means, like, unlimited gameplay. But in a game like Endless Ocean, where a part of it was to discover this one map that you would return to and slowly swim around and unlock the whole thing, why would I want to do the exact same map but scrambled? You know, just to look for that same cave or that same coral reef. So I'm already really suspicious. Not to mention, a good chunk of the map just kind of looked like this. It's just kind of empty and blue and it's just boring looking, to be perfectly honest. And a lot of the times I just found myself being like, please, just any animal, let me just get to any feature of note or any creature. Not to mention, because everything's happening in the one map, that means every species included in this game is all gonna be found in this one map and theoretically could all be found in like one session, I mean, a long session, but one session and that was very immersion breaking. I mean, obviously the game can't be perfectly realistic, but it was pretty weird, you know, you see like these little reef species and you would just go over this cliff and then there's like these deep sea pelagic creatures like right there. Um, so that was a huge step down, in my opinion, from the previous Endless Ocean games, where it actually felt somewhat region-specific, and the, the creatures you see made sense. I'll talk more about the creatures later, because that's a, a whole beast that I want to get into, quite literally. But as far as the map goes, I, I just think this is a huge step down, and it's not a game where I think it needed procedural generation. At cases where I like it, usually there's a set map, and then there's an aspect of procedural generation. For example, in maybe like a farming game, where you have a town, and then you would have like a mine you would go in adventuring in, and it would change every time. And then that would let the gameplay feel fresh and new every time, while still having like that first time feeling of exploring it a set place that felt like it had love and care put into it. Because that was another thing I miss is 
really feeling like the developers created this specific map and this ruin of this castle for us to explore. It was really exciting. Now I get that, again, procedural generation and procedural, procedurally generated maps means uh, replayability, but I'm not sure Endless Ocean is the kind of game that you replay a lot. Personally, despite the hours and hours I put into Endless Ocean 1 and 2, I don't think I ever gave it more than one play session because there was a lot of content to it. I wanted to 100%, you know, the whole creature collection. I wanted to see every single animal and I wanted to explore every bit of the map and that provided me hours and hours of content. But in this, I already started getting pretty bored just an hour into the game, feeling like, well, is this it? I mean, I'm sure it's not all of it, but it's a good chunk of it. Oh, let's talk about the animals for a bit, because that is the heart and soul of the Endless Ocean series. It is, after all, a game about scanning, cataloging, different ocean life. When this one was announced, they said there were, you know, there's gonna be like more species than ever, I'm pretty sure, and pretty excitingly they told us there would be extinct animals in it, and I believe legendary fantasy creatures as well? That I can't remember because I haven't discovered it yet. But that's pretty cool, I mean... How many of us would love to see a Megalodon, you know? So, I was very interested in hearing that, but I was very quickly disappointed in realizing that the extinct animals are just chilling with the non-extinct animals, which feels truly bizarre, to be honest. Like, I'm just hanging out with this stingray and this very real shark, and then I just look over and there's a bunch of, like, nautilus, and those ones with the, the heliocoprion or whatever, and the ophthalmologist, I can't remember the names of all of these, but, uh, it was very jarring. So if this felt like a missed opportunity to have, like, a specially accessed part of the map or part of the story in which you would find this, like, land lost in time and you would discover all of these extinct creatures instead of the fact that they're just, like, 20 feet away from a coral reef in this regular ocean. Well, it's not a regular ocean, it's some sort of weird ocean that changes every time you dive. But it's just, it's never really explained why. <laughs> They're all just hanging out here. And there was a, there was this like hole in the ground I, I came to. And when I dove down there, I did find, you know, a whole bunch of extinct animals down there, which was cool. But then they were also uh, outside that cave as well. So there wasn't even really like a lore or story region reason I think why all these extinct animals just exist. I feel like they just did it because it sounds cool to put extinct animals in a game. Um, that's like feels very disappointing. Like yeah, it's something I like, but I feel like I could have had a reason why you did this, and it just. If, yeah, they left me feeling let down. They also included some legendary creatures from the previous games, like our th friend Thanatos. He was this giant shark that was like protecting an area in one of the maps in the second game. Uh, so he's back in this game, but it just, instead of feeling like a really cool cameo from an actor that you love, it's just like, why are you here? <laughs> why are you here hanging out with the extinct animals in this cave? It's just odd. I just questioned why he was there in the first place, and why it looked like his model hadn't been updated since 2010. 
You know what? I take it back. 2010 Thanatos actually looked better, or at least more realistic. Yeah, just kind of a strange choice, and he's not the only one. There was this goblin shark guy. He was in the game as well. I forget which level he was in, but... So, for a split second, I was excited to see my old buddies again, but then I was like, well, this feels like the worst Marvel movie stinger, that I'm like, why did I stick around waiting for that? Oof. Another thing that really bothers me about the animals is that they don't feel like they notice me, or I don't feel like I'm really here. Uh, there were quite a lot of creatures in the previous games that were hostile toward you, and then you'd get like a warning, you know, a UI flash, and there'd be a noise, like, be careful, there are aggressive creatures around, and you would have to watch out. That has been completely taken out of this game, and I'm not saying that that was necessarily the right choice. Um, I think it should have been an opt-in, though, or an opt-out, maybe. It just feels like this game was made, like, too easy. It feels very dumbed down, and like my hand is being held the entire time. Like, I, I can't even be scared of this tiger shark. Tiger sharks are really aggressive. I'm, I'm not worried in the slightest. I can swim right up to it and bump into it. There's nothing wrong. Occasionally, my pro controller would, like, rumble a little bit, and this, like, dot would flash on the screen, and I thought that meant I was in danger, because I think I noticed it happening at first around a shark. So I thought, cool, it's warning me, and I really liked that feature. Then it seemed to beep even faster and louder at another time, but then I couldn't actually work out what it was trying to tell me. Uh, I think maybe there was like a rare animal around, which can we just say for a second, speaking of rare animals, they are not that rare? I feel like in just 20 minutes of diving, I saw like five or six really rare creatures. And part of that may be because they feel that gamers are more impatient now, so they need to be rewarded more frequently. But I don't know. I just miss the days when I'd be diving for 20-30 minutes just scanning regular little critters and boom, a colossal squid goes by and I'm just absolutely stunned because I've never seen one before in the game and it feels like a real accomplishment. So I do think that the whole rarity system, I'm not sure it works well. For example, this guy Thanatos, it says he's rarely seen and yet on my second dive, he was just hanging out. I, I've, I've seen him on every dive I've gone on now. Every dive. <laughs> so there's something about the gameplay of seeing these animals that just lost so much magic from the first two games. Part of that, I think, harkens back to the music, um, in which a lot of like lovely little musical flourishes would play when we see like a really giant whale, and sometimes like a little kind of cutscene almost would happen where we watch it for a bit. It was just a magical moment seeing the swim up, and some sweeping orchestral suite would play, and it just felt like a really nice moment. And in this, I'm like, oh wow, look at that huge animal, and it just kind of swims past your screen, and you're like, okay, well, that was that, I guess. In terms of the scanning of the animals, which is, like I said, like 98% of the gameplay, like that that's mainly the thing, something is really off about it or lacking, and it just feels kind of frustrating. Especially when you start and you have nothing scanned, and you're in like a coral reef with these big schools of fish, it just feels massively overwhelming rather than satisfying like it should be. And also the way of like unlocking these new creatures you haven't scanned is very annoying because you'll have to scroll through an endless number of fish in the schools of fish just to get to the new one. And like, I know we could have come up with a better system than this. I don't know who did the UI, but it's not super intuitive. It's it's not that easy. I just think 
and not a lot of thought was put into it. So something about scanning just feels more annoying than fun and I find myself like not wanting to scan because every time you do it, it's gonna pull you into the zoomed in fish view. Sometimes I just want to scan the animals for the XP or just to unlock the new animal and it was all animals I'd already scanned before and then I'm still forced to look at this close-up view and then I have to back out of it and it kind of just breaks up my diving process and it makes me feel like I have to stop swimming and yeah it like kills my vibe you know so scanning not nearly as fun it also doesn't do the whole thing where it scans for salvage like it used to in previous games instead salvage is just like randomly there, and in some cases, uh, painfully there, but I'll mention that in graphics. <laughs> so as I mentioned, yeah, a, a huge issue that I feel is that I just kind of feel like I'm invisible to these animals, like there's just no interaction, and I'm not sure what level I would like, but like at one point I saw this little pufferfish. <laughs> And it was really cute, and I realized the puffer fish was puffing up, you know, as a, shy, a sign, a show of kind of aggression, um, because I got too close to it, just like they do in real life. They only puff up when threatened, and then it calmed down when I left, and so I kind of kept, like, going back and forth, like, oh, is it really doing it because of me? And then, no, I realized it was just, like, on an animation sort of loop. And it didn't actually have anything to do with me. It was just puffing up and then deflating and then inflating and deflating. I have no impact on the game or on the creatures, seemingly. They don't seem to really be aware of me, the diver. They don't seem to interact with me, the diver. And they don't seem to be aggressive toward me, the diver. So segueing from that, I want to talk a bit about why why is there no uh, danger? There's nothing dangerous because in the second one we didn't only have like aggressive animals like sharks but we had animals like electric eels that if we just got too close to them they would shock us or we had big stingrays along the river floor that we couldn't get too close to. So we had animals that were defensive as well as offensive. And because there was no health bar in those games, what would happen if you got stung or bitten, attacked, whatever, was you just lost oxygen. Now, you've probably been watching me dive all this time and wondering, is this all like one session? And yes, it is all one session. In fact, my first time that I played, an hour or so ago, my first dive session lasted six days. That's right, six days. And this dive session in this video took me three days. So I'm down here, no sleep, no food, no water, no oxygen for three days. I talked a little bit about immersion breaking. I mean, that's like as much as it gets. So the removal of the oxygen tanks in Endless Ocean Luminous seems to be a decision made to try to make the game more relaxed, more cozy, which as a cozy game player, I kind of understand, but that was one of the few ways you could show progression in the game. You know, at the start of the previous games, you wouldn't be able to dive very deep or for very long. So you'd have to limit your dives and get better equipment so that you could do like night dives or deep sea dives. And um, I really liked this progression. It kept things from happening too quickly and it made sense. And even in the end game, you would still have to kind of watch your oxygen. Although by the end you had so much, it really didn't matter and you could just leisurely dive it wasn't a big deal. So I'm kind of baffled by their decision to take that out, especially when I feel like it could have just been a difficulty option, like an unlimited oxygen. I mean, I've even got an oxygen tank on my back, which is just for looks, apparently. 
apparently? Like what? Why? So by removing the oxygen tank, we remove any threat in this game, any sort of challenge of, oh, we can't take too long this dive, we're gonna run out. Which also means we've, re we've removed any sort of way for the player character to take damage. So I suppose that's why they decided there would be no aggressive animals in this. Again, I just don't really understand this decision. It feels very thumbed down, and I'm not really sure who the target audience is, because when I first played an Endless Ocean game, I was a kid. I was like 11 or 12, and I thought that the game was, you know, educational, fun, and not really much of a challenge. I mean, what was the worst if you ran out of oxygen? Like, I don't remember what happened, but it really wasn't that bad. So, I can't even imagine that a lot of kids would love just this hand-holdy experience where they don't think they can handle the threat of oxygen running out, or learn about the dangers of staying away from tiger sharks. So it just feels like a very sanitized kind of experience, and just not very true to the classic Endless Ocean games. While I'm still on animals, I should mention that the animal companion sort of system is back, although it's very different. Rather than choosing an animal to accompany you on your dive at the beginning of the dive, you can sort of just grab an animal <laughs> while you're diving. And at first, the size of the animal that you can take depends on your level. So you have to level up to be able to take like more and bigger critter critters. Um, I kind of like this system. It doesn't make sense why they're following you, but that's fine. So I got this little guy to follow me, and look at him, he's so goofy. Like, I don't really want, you know, just like a blue tang following me around because that looks like nothing, but this little goofy guy swimming after me, pretty fun. Although, at one point, he just up and left, and I still don't know if, like, did he just get tired of hanging out with me? Was there, like, a timer on how long he could stay? Or did I just move too far from his original starting point? I don't know. But anyway, I kind of like the new animal companion system. I think it's pretty good. Uh, unclear yet what it'll be like taking the bigger animals like dolphins and sharks and stuff because they haven't leveled up that far. And also, in the animals, um, one thing that I do think is a bit of a letdown is just the amount of info I'm given about the animals. I feel like I had a lot more in the past. And this could just be rose tinted glasses, but I feel like very quick blurbs about the different fish, and I don't feel like I've learned a lot. I understand that probably most people aren't necessarily wanting this to be an educational scientific experience, but I do like learning while playing games, so yeah, they felt kind of quick. Let's talk about the music for a second. Now, the original Endless Ocean game had an absolutely amazing soundtrack um, featuring this gorgeous singer, Haley Westenra, and she just has this very ethereal voice, and she sang a lot of classic songs like O oh Shenandoah, Amazing Grace, and I was introduced to a few ones I didn't know, like The Water is Wide. So a lot of the game is just like diving around, swimming around, a beautiful ocean vista, while listening to this woman's ethereal voice. Um, it just made it a really peaceful experience. And then in Endless Ocean 2 Blue World, they sort of continued that theme. There was a lot of like Celtic women songs in it, or Celtic woman songs, <laughs> um, but they continued that beautiful sort of musical genre. So I mentioned the music because to me, and I think most people who played the Endless Ocean games 1 and 2, music plays a big part of the experience. And while I wasn't expecting uh, Luminous to necessarily match that, 
Uh, it was pretty, it was one of the biggest letdowns, to be honest. It's just kind of quiet, instrumental music. It's relatively relaxing, but it's n nothing to write home about. Um, I would say none of the songs are even particularly like, oh, that's a really good relaxing one. I'll try to put in, like, maybe one that I find found most nice around here. But, um, it's all instrumental, which that might be a pro or a con for you. It's certainly no Carrick Fergus, though. <laughs> so, no Celtic women, no Haley Westenra. That's already you know, gonna be like two thumbs down for me. The characters, or the lack thereof. <laughs> I mentioned in Endless Ocean too. there was a whole suite of these fun NPCs that you would meet and then get to know, you would dive with them, you would chat with them on Nine Ball Island, and they both, they all, they all provided like different personalities and different, um, like specialties. And so far, there's Sarah, the annoying AI that I had to mute immediately, and I did meet this new guy, Daniel, who, let me just be brutally honest, is a poor imitation of the great GG. I mean, I just, I, I just can't help but compare them, you know? The two salvagers? So, also, given the fact that you seemingly only interact with the NPCs in this weird story mode, they just don't feel really present, and I end up not really caring about them. So I think something's really missing from the game by not having these NPCs tag along with you on your dives for better or for worse. I mean, I definitely remember being annoyed by them at times, but overall, I did kind of like what they brought to the table, and you didn't always have to dive with them, like you could dive alone. So... By the way, this is all footage from chapter 3, which, like I said, I would go back and do it. This one definitely had more actual gameplay rather than just constant cutscenes, but it was insanely quick. It would be like, find the salvage before Daniel does, and then you just turn around and it's like, right there. Or even in the last bit here, it literally just shows you directly on the map where you need to go. Again, like extreme hand-holding. And then, in this last one, when you actually pick up the thing, it's that mystery board 99 thing that's been on the main menu the entire time. So, it, it, I'm just confused by the fact that this is only mentioned in the third chapter which, as I said, I didn't even want to do. Are we supposed to be doing the story before we do the dives? Because it keeps telling me that my mystery board is lighting up, and I didn't even know what that meant because I hadn't done this yet. Just multiple times during the gameplay process, I felt like this was made by several teams of people that had zero communication among their teams throughout, like, the entire game. And so here they are, sort of ham-fisting in some sort of mysterious people, but like, we've been there, we've done that, and this is just not nearly as compelling as the stories in the previous games. And then that's it. That's the end of chapter 3. By the way, I fixed Daniel. You're welcome. So real quick, the graphics. Um, I just wanted to mention them because I found them so underwhelming. I wasn't expecting to be blown away, but in 2024, I feel like I expect slightly better graphics. Although, I will say, I think this is due to the limitations of the Switch hardware. It's old at this point, you know? The Switch is old, and unfortunately, this game was made for the current generation of the Switch rather than waiting for the next generation. But at times, I felt like there wasn't a huge difference between this and, like, Endless Ocean 2. Again, maybe that's rose-tinted glasses, and when I go back and I look at that Endless Ocean 2 footage, like I'm going to in a bit, I'll probably think, yeah, it is a step up, but is it a 12 years later step up? No, wait, not even 12, 14? 
14 years later, graphical improvement? I don't think so. Like, look at this texture right here. I mean, what's going on there? It's pretty bad. Yeah. I also seem to encounter this graphical bug that I didn't encounter the first time I was playing on my own, but I did while I was recording this, where the salvage pieces that I picked up that lit up my mystery board, again, whatever that is, uh, nothing showed up, and I definitely remember seeing things before, so it, it's just like these blank squares, and maybe that's the mystery. <laughs> the mystery continues. What? is this. Probably one of the worst parts is the bit that I was talking about earlier in terms of these like salvage pieces. Some of them, I don't know what sort of graphical bug it was, but it causes them to stick out like a sore thumb and you're like, oh well, I clearly have to go over there. I mean, on one hand it makes it easy and clear that that's where you need to go to get it, but it just looks bad, to be honest. Lastly, the co-op. This game was touted when it was announced that it would have up to 30 player online co-op. Wow. This isn't the first time we've seen online co-op in Endless Ocean. It was a thing in the second game, Blue World. I never tried this out because I didn't have Wi-Fi as a kid, uh, nor friends nerdy enough to want to play this with me, so I can't really speak to it. I did like to do this weird drawing thing in the water, though. Um, having played this for a while, I'm not really sure the benefit- well, I guess I'm never really sure what the benefit of doing co-op in this game would be, because it always seems like a single-player experience. However, I will amend that by telling you guys a story. Uh, when I was a kid, one night I was having a sleepover with two of my best friends, and we <laughs> we stayed up late on the Wii, and I had them play Endless Ocean. Now, we played it like single player, and we would just like pass the Wii mode back and forth, each taking turns like swimming. Now, they weren't like big fish nerds like I am, so they weren't as interested in it as I was. However, I still remember, you know, it's like midnight, we stayed up really late, and we were doing this deep sea dark dive, and one of my friends, as she's controlling the diver, you know, she gasps as a huge colossal squid swims past our screen, and we were all so stunned because it was such a rare event. In all the hours I've been playing, I'd never seen this colossal squid. It was just a truly exciting experience. And even though she wasn't that interested in like the game, she was like stunned, speechless to see this pixelated squid on our screen. It was just so exciting. And although it was not a co-op experience, it was still kind of a multiplayer gaming experience that we shared together. Back in the days when you just sit next to each other and pass a controller. So all that to say, I think something's made me lost when you all go off your separate ways and then ping each other to go tell each other that, and I don't know, maybe I'm just being jaded because I don't really have any friends that would play this. So I certainly don't have 29 friends that would play this. I don't even think I have 29 friends. <laughs> I just, um, I have no interest in playing the online co-op mode. I definitely, like, won't be checking it out, so I won't say too much negative about it, because, uh, it might be for you guys. You might really like it. But I'll just mention that it has the online mode, and maybe some of you can speak to it better than I can. Uh, I just have always thought Endless Ocean suits a single-player mode more. So overall, final thoughts, I just, I'm slightly curious why this game was made, because having played this for a few hours now, I can honestly say that I would have preferred if they had just remastered Endless Ocean 2 Blue World for the Switch. 
You know, it's an old game at this point, so I feel like the old graphics wouldn't even be that bad on the aging Switch hardware. I know ports are kind of difficult, I can't really speak to that at all because I have no experience in doing that, but given that it is such an old franchise with a long period since the last release, I feel that that would have been a better way to, haha, test the waters out and gauge what the current gaming fandom wants. And then that way, we could wait it for the next generation of the Switch and created Luminous for that next gen Switch hardware. This whole experience playing Luminous has just left me feeling like Arika doesn't really know what the Endless Ocean fandom, the few of us that are out there, uh, liked from the previous games or wanted in a future game because I feel like I'm sort of the target demographic for this, like a huge marine science nerd that loves fish. I even love tedious kind of games where I have to take a million years to explore and catalog every animal, and even I'm not having a great time. That should be, a, that's, that's a problem, you know? That's a big problem. You went wrong somewhere if even I'm pretty bored and not having a great time. I know that after all this, it, it sounds like I have a very, very negative opinion of the game, and it's not so much that as that I'm just massively disappointed. Um, it sounds like I want to return the game, which, you know, maybe I sort of feel that way, but actually, I'm gonna be playing this more on my own. That's why I'm saying that despite everything I'm saying, I'm letting you form your own opinions because I'm not necessarily recommending or not recommending. I'm presenting my thoughts, which are largely negative, but I'm still going to continue to play the game. I'm gonna give it more time, and at the end, the experience I've had is the experience that I've had. Overall, it hasn't been a super fun one so far. Really, I waited 14 years for this. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll come back here and update in the comments with my thoughts, but I can't see anything happening in the story to majorly make me like it more. The gameplay elements that are already there, the procedurally generated map, the odd story choices, is already enough to make me very disappointed that I waited 14 years for this sequel, when again, it just makes me want to go back and relive Endless Ocean 2. And for those of you who maybe started with this game and haven't gotten to play any of the originals, I feel bad. I, I wish that you could play them because I think they're a much better experience. As I said, I don't know that I'm saying I don't recommend it, because you might watch this and still think it looks really great, maybe especially if you didn't play the previous games. So if you like a really easy, no consequences whatsoever kind of exploration game about fish and stuff, then yeah, it's, it's the game for you, although you will still find it really repetitive, because of due to the nature of the limited map. Um, but if you're like me and you liked the previous games, I'm sure you're gonna find it lacking like, like I have. Overall, I just feel like they managed to take a lot of the magic out of the game and a lot of the joy that I felt. And as I've said multiple times, part of it might be rose-tinted glasses, just looking back on a happier time, but I do have such fond memories of playing Endless Ocean 2, whether I was frustrated because I couldn't solve this darn riddle, or I couldn't figure out how to unlock this part of the map, or because I was looking for another species in this one map that I couldn't find. But it was a classic gaming experience, and this game doesn't leave me frustrated in a challenged way, it leaves me frustrated in a bored way, and I just think that that's kind of poor of the on the developer's part. Like, think a little bit more of your gaming audience. <laughs> yeah, 
Alice My Endless Ocean Luminous Brutally Honest Review. I think one of the most offensive parts of it is that I paid 50 US dollars for it, when I honestly think it was worth like half of that. I know some of you are probably surprised to hear so much like negativity out of my mouth, although this isn't like as it's not that it's that negative, it's just that I'm normally really, really positive, I think. But I've gotten a lot of requests from people to actually do proper gaming reviews, um, so I hope you enjoyed hearing my thoughts, my very, very honest thoughts, because I do feel this way toward games a lot. You just normally don't see the game, especially if it's, like, really terrible and, like, not even worth showing you even a little bit. I think this one was worth showing you because at the end of the day, swimming around is still kind of ASMR, and me quietly rambling like this for literally an hour is kind of ASMR. <laughs> so even if you didn't care about the game or the fish at all, I hope you found this a relaxing experience, and hopefully my droning on and on put you to sleep. Uh, if it helped you make a decision about whether or not you want to get Endless Ocean yourself, um, then, then I'm really glad. One more thing that I just realized I read earlier. I don't know that I've seen it myself yet, but I heard that there are freshwater fish in this ocean. I just, um, just gonna leave you with that. What happened? What happened to my beloved endless ocean? Oh my god. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it through this whole thing. Oh my gosh, give yourself a pat on the back. If you like this different style review video, please, please give me a like and a comment telling me your thoughts, especially if you happen to pay $50 for this game. First off, sorry. Second of all, Please drop me a comment, tell me your own thoughts. Uh, did our opinions line up at all? Did you have differing opinions? I'd love to hear them. Um, if you're really enjoying the game and you didn't like some of the things I had to say, I'm sorry, those are just my opinions and you're totally free to have your own. If you're really enjoying this game, I'm super happy for you. In fact, I'm a little bit jealous because I wish I could have as good of a time playing the game. Alright, thank you guys. I love you all. Hope you have a relaxing week. And, um, if you want to support me, don't forget you could join my Patreon or become a channel member that directly supports me and I give you little perks like viewing my videos early and your name in the credits at the end. Alright, sleep tight. Night night, everybody. <laughs>